Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, where we will be discussing the global opportunities available for United States soybeans. Uh, my name is Spencer Chase. I'm the managing editor of our Washington, D.C. office for AgriPulse Communications. Thrilled to have you joining us here today, as well as a number of distinguished panelists that are joining us as well, uh, who I will briefly introduce uh, here in a few minutes. I promise I will be making myself scarce uh, so as to provide an opportunity for you to hear from the experts that we have here gathered uh, today. Uh, before we do get into some presentations and some opening comments, do want to just uh, offer up a couple of brief uh, housekeeping items. Uh, as I mentioned, I'll, I'll be giving very brief introductions. We have more comprehensive biographies available of, of these speakers on our website. Uh, also want to have an opportunity to interact with you throughout the course of this discussion. Uh, would encourage you to, if you have any questions for our panelists, uh, submit those through the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, not the chat function. Uh, and uh, if you have any issues with the Q&A function, let's be honest, we've all been using uh, Zoom for about 18 months now. It might be your fault. But, uh, but if you do, go ahead and submit that. Uh, you know, let us know uh, somehow, and we'll be happy, ha happy to offer whatever assistance we can uh, to get your question answered here by our panelists. Also, just want to note that uh, in the event that there is a, a comment that you maybe heard 75 and not 100% of, you'd like to listen to this later again, or maybe share it with a friend or colleague. We are planning to post the video of this webinar uh, later today to our website, and that is, of course, agripulse.com. Before we get into the uh, opening discussions, want to first uh, thank and appreciate our panelists and our uh, sponsors for today's discussion, that being the United Soybean Board, the U.S. Soybean Export Council, the American Soybean Association, and ASA's World Initiative for Soy and Human Health. And our first uh, panel is actually going to be some speakers from ASA's WISH program, uh, that being Liz Hare, Chris Slemp, and Gina Perry. I'm going to start uh, with some comments from Liz Hare. Liz is the executive director of ASA's World Initiative for Soy in Human Health. Uh, WISH recruited her to lead its programs in Central America and Pakistan before tapping her to take the reins of the organization as executive director in 2018. Joining Liz is going to be Chris Slemp, the project director for the Africa division of the WISH program. Chris started in 2014 as the project officer for the Africa division. And last but certainly not least in our first uh, presentation here is going to be Gina Perry, the project director for global strategy in the WISH program, a role that she started in March of 2019. She came to WISH after nearly four years with AgriCorps, a nonprofit focused on agricultural education in developing, in developing countries. And uh, so I will turn things over to the WISH crew for a little bit of discussion on the U.S. Soy International Marketing Strategy. Liz, take it away. Thanks so much, Spencer. I'm going to share my screen here so you can see my slides. Thanks for the opportunity to be with you here today. So the way that we have outlined the WISH portion of this presentation is I'm going to give you a little bit of context about WISH as an organization, why WISH exists, how WISH is designed to work. And then my colleagues, Chris and Gina, are gonna come on to give you some more details about some of the projects that we're actually implementing, what are we actually doing, so that you can kind of see the theory of how and why WISH is supposed to work put into practice. So first of all, um, the mission of our organization is to improve agricultural value chains and developing and emerging markets to create trade and long-term demand for U.S. soy. And the vision is that the way that that works is through the improvement of health, nutrition, and food security in these markets. So, but really the three things that we wanna highlight for you, we do have a new strategic plan that just came into effect October 1 of this year. And these three things that you see here on your screen right now are really the top three reasons why WISH exists and why U.S. Soy has an organization like WISH. The first is new market exploration and development. Everything that WISH does is designed to increase opportunities for export of U.S. Soy. The second is diversified strategic partnerships. Because of the nature of what we do, we are working all across the value chain and are working with partners in the private sector, the public sector, and key NGO stakeholders to build lasting markets for U.S. soy. And then the third is global food security. All of the countries in which WISH works need improved access to affordable protein. 
And so everything that WISH does is designed to increase access to that affordable protein, whether that's soy-based foods or through work in feed like aquaculture feed or poultry feed. This is just a quick brief overview for you about how U.S. Soy's international marketing strategy is designed. So we have the world divided into four, divided into four different sectors, developing, emerging, expansion, and mature. As you can see there, the circled sectors are the only sectors in which, in which WISH is active. So we are active in the developing and the emerging market space. A lot of the countries in which we work, you will either see no U.S. soy exports currently or very few that are happening right now. And then USEC, who you'll hear from in a little bit, is active in the emerging expansion and mature market space, and they'll tell you more about that work soon. Here are the countries in which WISH currently has projects. We're active in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And then just to go into a little bit more detail for you about some of these three key points, global food security being the top one, the U.S. soybean farmers who lead WISH put global food security at the top of our new strategic plan. And the reason that they did that is because they see engagement in food security and in these conversations as a real win-win for both U.S. soybean farmers and for the countries in which we work. We know that U.S. soy can be a solution in trying to increase affordability and availability of protein. And so U.S. soybean farmers know that if they engage in this conversation and continue to invest in these markets, there is an opportunity to build new markets for U.S. soy in this space. So I'm going to have my colleague Chris come on and tell you some more about what we're doing one thing I forgot to mention is that we are going to give some of our explanation in the context of three international days that we are celebrating in October and November. So World Food Prize, World Food Day, and World Fisheries Day. And Chris is going to tell you some more about what we're doing in Africa. Chris? Thanks, Liz. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to talk briefly about the types of strategies and partnerships that WISH uses to build soy demand in these emerging and developing markets that Liz was talking about. So um, we've been working with a food technologist to commercialize a nutritionally enhanced version of a commonly consumed food product called GARI. And we've been doing this work in Ghana and Nigeria. So GARI is a, a product that's consumed by millions of people throughout West Africa, and it's considered to be a, a staple food item for many families. And it comes from cassava, which is a root vegetable. And when it's all processed and ready to eat it, it basically um, looks, looks like a flower. Um, but the problem is that it doesn't have a lot of nutritional value. And so we've been working with a Ghanaian food technologist named Leticia Amakwa Chum, who's actually pictured here, uh, to improve the nutritional quality of gari. And she's doing this through the addition of defatted soy flour and a micronutrient blend with the goal to uh, decrease malnutrition. So Leticia has actually had her research on this product um, published in peer-reviewed journals, and she's just really passionate about introducing this innovation to new markets and helping us to commercialize the process. So it's it's been really exciting to work with Leticia and um, just because she's so passionate about this um, project. Um, and, and for us, um, this product offers an excellent opportunity for us to increase use and consumption of U.S. soy because um, there's a, a clear need that exists in many of these markets to address malnutrition. Um, and so last week, actually, uh, Leticia just completed the uh, phase one of the commercialization process in Nigeria. And in this case, we actually already have a supply chain partner in place located in Lagos and they are currently importing U.S. defatted soy flour, and, and they're ready to meet this uh, anticipated demand for the product um, in, in, uh, for including in this um, improved GARI product. So this is really the type of opportunity that um, really allows U.S. soy to shine because 
Letitia really makes it clear in her training of these GARI processors and, and through the development of standard operating procedures that quality is extremely important um, to this product. And so um, it's really a, a great fit for US soy and we're really excited about um, expanding the use of this product. Next slide, please. And so um, in addition to the types of innovative researchers that we work with, like Letitia, we also work with a variety of entrepreneurs um, like ProSoya, which is a company located in Kenya that uh, produces both food and feed. And I think what really struck me about ProSoya when I first met their leadership team in 2020 was just their willingness to just say yes and embrace change. And I think just like any company, this can be difficult sometimes. I think many um, leaders can often be resistant to change and, and stuck in their ways, but they've been very open to a lot of ideas and opportunities that we've presented them with since the start of our partnership. And I think you really see this mentality in uh, ProSoya's innovation manager, uh, which is Frida Kaburu, who's actually pictured here on, on this slide. And Frida's been a very dynamic leader and she's helped her team to make the most of our partnership since we've started working together. I think one of the most uh, impactful initiatives that we've led with ProSoya has been a lean management training. And so if you're not familiar with lean management, it's all about improving efficiency and reducing waste. And so Frida has really opened up her factory to um, our lean management team to allow them to really kind of critically examine the processes um, that are currently in place and uh, provide them with suggestions for improvements and, um, and, and feedback, um, which you, you don't always find managers that are, are willing to, um, to, to, to take that on. So, and we see the importance of this type of training as um, it helps us to build businesses that are profitable and, and healthy functioning and resilient businesses. Um, and this helps to ensure the long-term success of these companies. And this, this type of resilience is extremely important in the markets where we work because there's so many risks and variables outside of our control. And so it really helps us to build long-term partnerships. So I, I hope these examples give you a good idea of the type of work, uh, the type of market development work that uh, we've uh, been involved in in these markets. Um, uh, anyways, I'll pass it over to uh, Gina now. Thanks, Chris. Um, as Liz mentioned, WISH just implemented a new strategic plan. Um, one component of that is new market exploration and development. And WISH really takes the lead in identifying new markets uh, for diversifying the US soy opportunity. Um, so today I'll speak briefly on Ghana's poultry industry. We celebrated World Egg Day on October 8th and highlighted the work that WISH has implemented through its Amplifies project um, and our continued work in the poultry value chain in Ghana. Amplifies was a USDA uh, food for progress project that focused on increasing affordable and accessible high quality poultry feed in Ghana. Uh, through the project, we work with poultry farmers on improved farm management practices, um, post-harvest loss, uh, we implemented feeding demonstrations that focused on proper feeding rations, feeding to the genetics of the bird. Um, and a big part of that was including the benefits of soy as the feed's protein source, uh, which also worked with feed mills to improve the production of high quality feed, implement better quality control measures, and ultimately reduce feed waste as well. Um, another big component of the Amplifies project was a national egg campaign, which was a consumer education campaign that really talked about the benefits, the health benefits, nutritional benefits of consuming eggs. So in Ghana, protein um, can be expensive and not easily accessible, uh, but eggs provide a more affordable protein source for both children and adults. Um, the egg campaign utilized radio, television, and in-person events. Um, and we really 
we're able to utilize stakeholders across the value chain, including dietitians, um, representatives from the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, the Ministry of Health, um, as well as uh, poultry farmers to really disseminate the messaging of why eggs are important, um, why they're an important part of the diet, and to dispel cultural myths around the consumption of eggs. Um, so Amplifies had three egg consumption surveys that we administered, um, and in 2020, we found that 73% of people who heard Wishes um, egg campaign or Amplifies its egg campaign messages reported that the information positively changed their perceptions about eggs and their nutritional benefits. Um, so we see this is ultimately contributing to protein consumption um, and to increase use of soybean. Um, in the poultry feed. So as the project wrapped up, stakeholders, including poultry industry leaders and the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, uh, created the National Egg Campaign Secretariat to really continue this momentum um, and education efforts that were built through Amplifies. Uh, through USDA funds, which is continuing to support the Egg Secretariat to train dietitians from Ghana's Ministry of Health, uh, on the most up-to-date nutritional information, scientific information, so that they can go into communities and continue to educate consumers on why they, could, they should consume eggs and why it's an important protein source. Um, along with continued education, the Egg Secretariat is also working with other poultry value chain associations um, to host financial trainings and technical trainings for, for poultry farmers. Uh, so they can continue to meet consumer demand of protein. Um, so we know that Ghana cannot currently produce enough soy to meet the demand of the local poultry industry, and we're continuing to see the demand for poultry and egg products um, climb in Ghana. Uh, for example, per capita consumption of eggs in Ghana was 172 in 2016, and we found that has jumped to 235 in 2020. So just as a point of reference, um, U.S. per capita consumption of eggs uh, was 293 in 2019. So we see that there's still great opportunity for this demand and consumption to grow in Ghana. So increased demand for protein, specifically eggs and poultry in Ghana, creates a long-term trade partner for U.S. soybean farmers. Um, and through Amplifies and Wishes continued poultry value chain work, both poultry farmers and feed mills and others along the poultry value chain in Ghana understand the economic and nutritional value of soy and poultry feed. Um, and this further builds the demand and diversifies potential markets for US soy. Uh, back to you, Liz. Thanks, Gina. Okay, and the last thing we really wanna highlight for you all here is diversified strategic partnerships. So both Chris and Gina have mentioned this, but we work very closely with partners all across the value chain, whether that is on farm, um, feed millers, feed processors, food processors, um, and then even in end markets to be sure that the full market system is in place to be able to create sustained demand for US soy and sustainable trading partners for US soy. So sometimes that means we're working with the private sector, sometimes we're working with key NGO stakeholders, and sometimes quite often we're working with regional governments to be sure that everything is in place to be able to import US soy when the market is ready. Um, this, this picture that you see here is our aquaculture project in Cambodia. We, we refer to it as CAST. It's a USDA funded food for progress project. And you can see all of the various partners that we're working with here on that project. We work closely with US land grant universities, but then also that private and public sector that I mentioned earlier. And then finally, just a shameless plug for you all to join us on LinkedIn if you're interested so you can continue to follow some of WISH's work. And we really hope that this presentation has given you an idea of how engagement in the food security space and new market development in these developing and emerging markets can really create long-term demand for US soy. Back to you, Spencer. 
Well, thank you very much, Liz, as we uh, work now to transition to the next part of our program, which is going to be that discussion uh, with the folks in, uh, you know, maybe that other part of the uh, soybean uh, exporting uh, promotion process. And that, of course, being the folks over at the U.S. Soybean Export Council. And we're going to bring in two speakers now to address uh, some of uh, the work that USEC does. Uh, first speaker being Kerry Claghorn, who serves as the Senior Director of Market Development for USEC. And in this role, she is responsible for coordinating the efforts in USEC's focus areas of animal and aqua utilization, oil and human utilization with sustainability being a key part of each of those sectors. Roz Leek also joining us as the Senior Director for Global Market Access at USEC. She's responsible for worldwide activities, monitoring and addressing trade barriers and other market access issues that impact the, US, the US's ability to export soy and soy products. And uh, they will both uh, be providing us with a, a quick presentation on the, some of the broader trends and international market demand that we're seeing uh, with USEC's approach to getting those US soybeans into the hands of foreign buyers. So Roz and Kerry, take it away. Thank you very much, Spencer. And I'm going to share my screen. Um, so it's always a pleasure to be here to, to speak with you all. And it's certainly a pleasure to do so with our partners at WISH because as Liz very eloquently talked about, you know, WISH is in kind of those frontier markets, those very early development stages. And then as the markets develop, thanks to the work by WISH, then they, they transition over to us. So. I want to talk just a little bit today about some of the work we're doing. And first, I think it's important to, to give a little bit of a, um, a view to who USEC is. And for those of you who may not be very familiar with us, we are a membership organization. We're farmer owned and farmer led. Uh, but as you can see, we have over 100 members that represent all aspects of the value chain from farmer organizations to input suppliers, equipment manufacturers, some state departments of agriculture, and um, other service providers as well as exporters. So when we talk about the value chain, we, we get to touch and we get input from all aspects of it. Also like to put up our, our global footprint. So as you can see, these are how we're designed and are set up in regions. Um, when you see the Sub-Saharan Africa, um, in most of those markets, with the exception being Nigeria, we are simply working on market access in partnership with WISH. However, in these other markets, we do have uh, market development activities, and Carrie is going to highlight a couple of those key initiatives that we have, as well as some of the, the markets that have moved from uh, developing to emerging, and some of them have even now moved on to the expansion space. I wanted to give you uh, an indication of the market stages and priorities. So Liz had put up a slide on this as well. And so we have the developing, emerging, expansion, and mature. And for USEC, our activities are primarily focused in the emerging, expansion, expansion and mature. Um, and as you can see, when you're talking about what's happening in those markets, 93% of the value of U.S. soy trade happens in the expansion and mature areas. Um, but we recognize that particularly in the mature markets, there's not much opportunity for growth. We might have some marginal benefit to increase our market share there, but by and large, those are not growth markets. So when we look to the future, where the opportunities really exist in uh, for, for the U.S. soy industry is certainly in the expansion area, but they're already moving along that curve. But back in the emerging area and the developing space is where we, we will see the future demand come from. So on the markets that we work in, um, we were, as, as I said, emerging expansion and mature. Here's kind of the activities that we undertake in those markets. So in our focus areas, which um, carry oversees kind of the, the, the market development activities by focus area, we have animal protein, aquaculture, human utilization, and sustainability. So as you can see, we're focusing our program areas in the emerging and expansion space on the animal and aqua. And then in human utilization, there's uh, a little bit more opportunity in the mature markets because there are uh, good demands for high value uh, soy ingredients. 
And then sustainability across all aspects, because regardless of where the market is on the continuum, there is opportunities to discuss sustainability, not just from a trade and export standpoint, but even to talk about sustainability for um, them, for the industries within those countries to try and, and help reduce their environmental impact, as well as be more sustainable and viable economically and socially. And across all of these markets, we work market access. And um, we actually work across not just the market development stages that USEC is focused on of the emerging expansion and mature, but we also work in the developing markets, which um, is obviously where WISH has the leadership as it relates to market development. However, on market access issues, we partner with them to try and ensure that when those markets are ready to bring in US soy, we're able to, to, to accomplish that. So it's, it's truly a great partnership. How do, we talk, how do we work on market access? Collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. So not just with WISH, but when we talk about how we actually effectuate change, the, the most important thing that we have to remember is that when we're in these international markets, we aren't the constituency. We're there to sell something or to, you know, that's at least the impression, which isn't always our intent, but it's the impression is that there, we're there to try and sell something. Sometimes it truly is capacity building. But what we found is that the, since the domestic um, industry and partners are the constituency, they are the ones who have the, they're in the best position to be able to influence what's going to happen there from a regulatory or policy standpoint. So we want to work to empower them with the uh, information they need in order to carry that forward. The other uh, important part of collaboration is cross commodity engagement. So that's us working with US Grains Council, US Wheat Associates, Almond Board occasionally, uh, sometimes cotton, rice, it just depends on the topic, but to try and work collaboratively to address these issues that we face in the international markets. And then like-minded partnerships. And what do I mean by that? Sometimes we partner with our competitors. Sometimes we work with Brazil, Argentina, Canada, Paraguay, Uruguay, to try and address pre-commercial issues that are impacting the overall marketplace. And at the end of the day, much of what I do, yes, ultimately we want it to be sales, but in the beginning, all we're really trying to do is make sure that there's positive regulatory outcomes that enable trade rather than focusing on sales. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Carrie to talk about some of the specific market development activities we have going on around the world. Thank you, Roz. Um, yeah, so it's I, I really want to highlight a few of these emerging and expanding markets, along with some of our unique programming that is happening in these markets. And Roz is driving the slides. So Roz, next slide, please. I have a lot of slides, so we're going to move through them pretty quickly. But I think it's important to be able to show you some of the visuals that you can um, take a look at some of these graphs as things uh, uh, as as we move through these programs. This first graph just shows population and the urbanization of population. So we know that as the population uh, moves to the cities, that they will consume more protein. You see the purple line; that is the urbanization movement. The blue line is the uh, the protein. Uh, consumption that grows along with that. And one thing I do want to mention that is important to note about this slide is that the, the future global shift to urban areas that's projected is outside of China. So that's important to note. There is global urbanization happening everywhere. Next slide, please. Um, this this shows the soybean demand and the projection for that, and it's over it's overlaid with the urbanization. So you see the demand and the projection for growth and demand of soy protein and and soybean demand, and you see the dots that are there that uh, that show the urbanization. So long term demand, we are in a growth industry. Next slide, please. And I want to highlight some of these markets. Some of these markets would have been developing markets a few years ago, as as Liz uh, mentioned. Um, then they, as they begin to the demand grows and they begin to import soy, it becomes uh, part of in USEC's portfolio. So let's move to the next slide, and then you can. I just want to highlight the top twenty. Uh, U.S. destinations for uh, U.S. soy, and it you can see that many of these markets are emerging markets, expansion markets that um, have really come on the scene of late. Next slide, please. 
Um, I got to highlight, there are five of these markets that are really interesting to highlight. Um, Egypt, really interesting market. Currently, they are home to over 100 million people. Um, their population is increasing and is expected to increase by 50% over the next 30 years. 80% of that growth will come in the cities. You can see now that Egypt is, is uh, U.S. soy's number four market. Um, they have a very, uh, very growing uh, poultry industry. Uh, it, it's expected to grow by 50% in the next 15 years. And they are number three in the world in tilapia uh, production. They have gone from mostly a meal importer to a whole bean importer. Their crush sector has uh, really uh, grown a lot. Next slide, please. Our next market is Bangladesh that I really want to highlight. This has been a really exciting market. It is more, um, it's expected to more than double in the next six years. It is now the 14th largest market for U.S. soy. Um, this overall population growth is expected to continue. The urbanization, this is another place that urbanization is happening. And the demand for uh, soy is expected to grow another million metric tons in the next few years. Next slide, please. It's interesting that Mexico would be in here because Mexico is a well-known trading partner of U.S. commodities, right? It's a great market for US, the U.S., has been, uh, but will continue to be. The urbanization is, is still happening in Mexico. It is still growing. Um, Mexico, it is expected that while almost 80% of Mexico lives in urban areas already, that it's expected to grow by another 35 million, this urbanization piece. Pro-exporter tells us that the urbanization metric is a better way to gauge demand than population growth itself. So it's an interesting uh, look at Mexico and the, the potential that, that we see in Mexico uh, coming in the next 15 years. Next slide, please. Vietnam is uh, another really fast growing market. The crush sector, again, is a sector that has very uh, grown a lot and gotten very sophisticated. Vietnam is now the 11th largest destination for U.S. soy. The volume shipments through May were at all time high. So a uh, lot of demand even um, during the, the last two years. So over the next 30 years, Vietnam cities will add another 30 million people living in urban areas. You know, when you live in urban areas, your uh, lifestyle improves and you're able to purchase more, uh, more protein. As we saw in that chart, demand continues to rise. As a result, the, the soy complex in, um, Vietnam is expected to grow by over 40%, so to, expected to grow to another 10 million metric tons, or to, to, to over 10 million metric tons. Um, next slide, please. So Nigeria. So this is one of those developing markets that, and Liz mentioned it, uh, Roz mentioned it as well. This is a market of the future, both WISH and USEC see this as a long-term opportunity. Uh, it, there are some interesting metrics here. You can see that Nigeria is, a, is a, a, the seventh most populous nation in the world and will be the third most populous nation in, in citizens under the age of 30. Very young population, very young population. There are some challenges in this market, um, lots of unemployment. Um, they have a hundred, uh, their, their growth in the working age population is expected to increase by 125% by 2050. There's some challenges in that. There's some long-term unemployment, but we also see great potential here. You notice the uh, the, the uh, parts of the, the charts on the right, the consumption of uh, pr number of eggs and um, chicken per capita is very low, even compared to other emerging markets. So we see great potential here. We have uh, someone mentioned, maybe uh, I think Liz maybe mentioned a soy excellence center. So Nigeria is home to one of our soy excellence centers, at which I'd like to talk about next. Uh, Roz, next slide, please. So the soy excellence centers uh, came about because we had a real opportunity with the um, addition of ag trade promotion funds. So the ATP funds that were provided by uh, USDA 
to mitigate the effects of the China trade war, um, we were able to take advantage. USEC was awarded some of the ATP funds, and we were able to do some unique programming and do some long-term investments. One of those was this is the Soy Excellence Centers. Um, they are uh, they provide world-class workforce. Uh, training and capacity building. Um, this is one of this is where these will be located in areas where we are transitioning from developing into uh, emerging markets, emerging and expanding markets, um, where there's a lot of room to sophisticate and help train the supply chain. I just want to, uh, if you go to the next slide, well, you can see here. I'll let me stop here for a minute. The curriculums that are developed here are. Uh, for a poultry cur curriculum, feed production, aquaculture, uh, soy food processing. And in Nigeria only, we do have an ag agronomy, a soy agronomy uh, tract. Um, it's supported by uh, many partners. Uh, we can't do our work without partners. Um, many of the land grant universities, both domestically and internationally, help us develop these curriculums and deliver material uh, to the workforce. So next slide, please. We have established um, uh, we have established soy excellence centers in five locations around the world. Um, in, and you can see that there's one to serve the Americas region, Nigeria for sub-Saharan Africa, Egypt um, for uh, North Africa. And then we have uh, Singapore and Thailand uh, with some specialties related to human protein and animal nutrition. So next slide, please. This is a picture of uh, one of the graduating classes. So um, these are certificate programs. The certificate programs mean an awful lot to both the companies and um, to the participants. This is a, a picture of a graduating class in Egypt at the Soy Excellence Center, where we partner with World Fish for the aqua track, and we partner with Cairo University for the poultry track. Um, this, this, uh, these, these classes that are going through the Soy Excellence Centers are building networks. They are um, networking not only with each other, but with the industry. And we believe this is the next generation of leadership in the soy supply chain. So we're working with uh, tomorrow's leaders um, in, these, in these programs, and it's very exciting. They have gained a lot of momentum. Uh, the ATP funds was a way for us to kickstart them, but there's a lot of momentum and we're very excited about the opportunities to work with tomorrow's leaders in the soy supply chain um, today. So next, next slide, and I'll, I'll share one more kind of exciting program. The, um, these are protein poll campaigns. And if you go to the next slide, um, this we, we developed um, in some of these markets, we developed what we called a protein poll campaign. The first one was in India, again, with the uh, opportunity that was afforded to us with the award of ATP funds, we were able to develop these kind of long-term programs the first one in India was called the Right to Protein Campaign. It was a campaign that was developed to highlight the benefits of protein consumption in a healthy diet, um, to educate uh, what, what foods contained high protein. It was just kind of a generic protein poll campaign as these markets were uh, developing and we wanted to have these kinds of conversations. Um, there were lots of creative ways that this happened. Um, they built in, in India, for example, they built apps for phones. Uh, they had a lot of virtual events. They had games. There were many things that we had uh, influencers, and I'll show you a photo here in a second. But it, it worked uh, really well. It's, it's transitioning now. We've had that program since 2019, and it's transitioning now. Um, it, we also had a protein pull campaign in Nigeria. We have now launched a protein pull campaign in Pakistan, um, and uh, there we just completed a protein pull campaign, virtual campaign using influencers, etc., talking about general nutrition in Sri Lanka that we did in partnership with Usapik. Again, it takes a lot of partners. It takes internal partners. The India program was done with partnership from the Indian Poultry um, Association as well as other in-country organizations. Next slide, please. These were some of the key messages um, that we just to promote overall protein and health. And if you go to the next slide, 
Um, these were, this is just a quick uh, screen grab. And this is, again, this is the India Right to Protein campaign of some of the influencers. And you can see some of the views at the bottom. This is a very small sip, snippet of some of the views and participation we had, especially in India with their very large, um, very large uh, population. But uh, we had a lot of discussions about protein and health and what that means. Uh, there's now a, na a National Protein Day in India among other things. So great opportunities um, to make uh, good partnerships and to uh, help us develop that market. I will so tell you that they just launched the one in Pakistan. There's a there's a social media, vi media video that's out. And the last time I heard just last week, there were 3.5 million views on that video so far. So really good stuff coming out of these kind of unique campaigns. And again, unique partnerships. So um, with that, I think I will turn it back to Spencer. Very good. And I'm going to bring back uh, really the whole uh, the whole crew back into a, a question and answer period as we look forward to discussing uh, in, in a little bit more depth some of the thoughts that were shared in those in, in those WISH and USAC presentations as we uh, invite everybody to unmute their video, uh, unmute their audio, and, and come back to us again as a reminder to the audience, uh, please use that Q&A function uh, to submit any questions you might have for this panel uh, here as, uh, as we've got uh, just shy of 20 minutes here uh, for some Q&A with, uh, with these folks. And uh, we have a question that was actually submitted from the audience uh, that I'd like to start things off with. And it's uh, something I was kind of wondering as well, as we look at both the uh, WISH and the USEC conversations, you know, the, the promoting of US soy is obviously what you do, but there are soybeans grown in a lot of different parts of the world. And, uh, you know, somebody watching uh, along with us so wonders how the U.S. competes with Brazil and Argentina in some of these emerging markets. Is, is there that competition from some of those uh, foreign, uh, foreign producers as well? Or are other countries more so focused on uh, hitting some of those bigger players, some of the mature markets that were, that were referred to in, uh, in earlier presentations? Crickets, not, no not all wants to answer, here. Spencer. <laughs> I'll just give a general overview. So I think, you know, the things that we focus on are reliable, sustainable U.S. soy. Reliable means things like a reliable logistics supply chain, reliable supply, sustainable environmental sustainability of U.S. soy. Um, but then also, obviously, the technical assistance and the work that we're doing on the technical assistance side to actually provide people with skills of how you utilize U.S. soy. So sometimes that means we're working with feed formulators about what is the value in U.S. soy that potentially doesn't exist in soy from other countries. Um, sometimes that means a lot of the wish work is directly on farms with farmers. So we are not on, on a farm in Cambodia talking to farmers about what's the difference between U.S. soy and what's the difference between Brazilian. Because as you saw on Raz's slide, that differentiation of, of U.S. soy from other soy sources doesn't come in really until that emerging expansion marketplace. On the WISH side, what we're really trying to do is why would you use soy at all? What's the point of using soy? And showing farmers that if you're using well-formulated soy-based feed, even though it's more costly at the beginning, it's going to ultimately be less costly and provide you with a higher profit in the end. So we're really in that, in that developing space, we're really on that just what's the point of using soy at all? How does it benefit you? And then as we move into that, emerging expansion space, that's when the differentiation really starts to happen. Yeah, and I, I will just add to that, that in that differentiation space, again, we aren't in markets saying U.S. versus other origins. We're not doing that, but we're talking about the value of U.S. soy. We have developed tools to help differentiate. So when we work with feed formulators, we work with um, many um, in the industry on, on the value of U.S. soy. Uh, the value of the oil, the, the, you know, the refining advantages, those kinds of things. We also, um, you know, we have, we, we do our traditional work with technical assistance and those kinds of things, but as markets become more, uh, you know, they, they become more developed 
and they they are in the expansion area, then we also provide a lot of risk management, a lot of market intelligence, a lot of opportunities for companies to to take advantage of of, of the marketing of, of U.S. soy and, and to be able to battle, use the the value of U.S. soy in their marketing with their customers. So um, you know it, it it takes what what um, Wish does and and we expand on that as the market sophisticates. Another question submitted that uh, that I think is interesting, and obviously when we talk about uh, you know using U.S. soy for things like animal feed, either you know there is probably a place for for the American product there. But uh, somebody asked how domestic production uh, in the, some of these destination markets factors in, uh, you know, in you know especially given the push for some domestic production in some of these countries where uh, U.S. soybeans might be uh, might be headed. How does that uh, that local production factor into the, uh, the promotion, the education efforts underway on the part of, uh, of WISH and USEC. Yeah, Liz, do you, uh, so Liz, I'll, 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 tr I'll take off first. Be, we, so there's enough demand for all production. I mean, we, we aren't, we are not in a protein surplus situation, nor do I expect that we will be. So, you know, even when you see someplace like Europe who says, you know, we want to be more independent on our protein production, or you see, you know, Japan produces soybeans, China produces quite a lot of soybeans. It, it's, it's going to take all of it. There's plenty of room for all of it. And so our main objective, and one of the things that we're doing in the developing market space is not just talking about access for U.S. soy, but trying to, to dispel some of the myths that, ex, that um, some of these developing markets have. So particularly in, in countries like Kenya, or Nigeria who produce their own soy, they have this misconception that if they if they convert over to biotech or they allow biotech into their market, that it's going to make it impossible for them to trade with other trading partners. So one of our key messages that we've been delivering in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular is no, no, 60% of our product is exported, 94% of our production is GMO. And Europe, by the way, which you often think is doesn't accept GMOs, they're the second largest importer of GMO soybeans in the world behind China. So that's been some of the strategy too, is just to dispel some of those myths, but not at all are we concerned about there being any competition between imports and uh, local production. You know, honestly, the more successful that the local producers can be, the more comfortable they are allowing for trade. And so from our perspective, that's a, that's a success. And I'll just add to that, Spencer, one of the things that we talk a lot about on the WISH side is our goal is never to displace local production. That's not what we're interested in doing. Uh, we know, as Gina mentioned before, in places like Ghana, there's not enough production right now to meet existing supply as it stands today. We know that if you look at projections of how Ghana is expected to grow both in population and economy, there's no way that local production can meet what is expected to happen in the next five to 10 years. So what we're really trying to do is find ways to fill that gap. We have, we have feed processors in Ghana telling us we need raw materials, we cannot get them. Help us figure out ways to do that. So we're really working, like Raz said, there's so much work being done on the market access side to be sure that there is actually potential for trade. And then also filling in that supply chain gap, being sure that there is, as Chris mentioned, the, the companies are financially stable. They have access to financing. They're able to actually get product in. So that's a lot of stuff that's happening behind the scenes that doesn't come across on the technical assistance side. You don't see it, but there's a lot happening on these bigger structural issues like access to financing of how can we actually make this a, 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 a possible trading environment, especially in the developing markets. And Gina and Chris, I want to bring you into the conversation as well here as uh, we've got a question submitted from the audience, uh, kind of referencing some of the uh, protein educational uh, initiatives uh, that are that are underway on the part of WISH. And, and Gina, you specifically mentioned some of the efforts uh, relating to uh, to eggs in, in Ghana. Uh, a questioner is wondering if uh, if this is an education issue or a protein affordability issue. And and if it's an affordability concern, are, are your educational uh, efforts maybe maybe capped a little bit by by those affordability issues? How how does Wish approach that concern? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So I think affordability is a huge hurdle um, in these markets. Um, we are seeing though that as incomes increase, people are you know ultimately 
positioning towards consuming more protein. So whether that's eggs, meat, fish, um, et cetera. So we do see that shift happening. Um, with the education, it's interesting because there are some cultural aspects of consuming eggs or misconceptions or misinformation that easily spread through, you know, WhatsApp messages or, um, you know, kind of the non-traditional um, communications. Um, so I think that what WISH does, especially within the poultry value chain, um, we're addressing, you know, kind of from as soon as the, the crops leave the farm gate, so post-harvest loss, um, through processing, through selling to poultry, to developing associations within the poultry value chain to really kind of address um, where the high prices come in at first. So feed costs are about 60% or more of production costs in Ghana. So that's a huge hurdle. So if we can help decrease that, you know, we see that ripple effect down the value chain and to consumers. So it does take one um, kind of this effort on technical assistance and training and addressing these um, kind of barriers to entry and capital requirements. Um, and then we can kind of bring in that education campaign and see as prices decrease on eggs and they're more available um, that consumers are more willing to buy now that they have this, this background and information. Mm -hmm. And Chris, uh, another uh, another attendee wonders. Uh, it also brings up the affordability question, and wondering how some of these soy fortified foods that, uh, that were discussed, for instance, you mentioned gari in your in your presentation. Wondering how the affordability of those foods uh, might compare to some of the other things that are that are aware and, and available to uh, to local consumers. That's a good question. Um, so gari is is typically. Um, What's interesting about it is that it's actually uh, consumed across um, the socioeconomic spectrum by uh, low income and, and high income earners. It, it's very much a traditional um, food in, in many people's diets. Um, and so, yeah, we, we are, we are um, sensitive to the fact that keeping it at a competitive price is important to the success of the product. And actually part of this first phase of commercializing the product uh, was a consumer survey. And so uh, we actually were out there gathering data to determine um, how much people are willing to pay for the product. Are they willing to pay extra for the product? Um, because it is somewhat of a premium product with the addition of these uh, micronutrients and, and defatted soy flour. So um, yeah, we, we are uh, definitely aware of that and, and, um, and, and trying to um, make sure that it, it's not something that's going to um, be priced out of um, the average consumer's um, budget. Okay, very good. Roz, you had mentioned in your uh, in your discussion, you know, some of the uh, some of the local perceptions of folks that might uh, that might be arising as uh, the U.S. producer or USEC or whoever is the actual face of the effort uh, comes in. Uh, you know, a, a question kind of comes back to some of that initial early work that the U.S. might be doing, and it really is sort of this age-old market development question, whether we're talking about a USEC or maybe your friends at Grains Council, USMEF, some of the other uh, U.S. export promotional uh, opportunities, some concern about the potential for U.S. efforts to maybe open up these uh, markets for uh, foreign goods. I, I know this is probably an age-old question, but how, how does USEC view uh, that in in the in just in the lens of trying to grow the U.S. Uh, you know demand for U.S. soy there, but also making sure that demand is for U.S. soy. Well, and so Liz can probably add to this conversation as well because some you know part of it is is you just have to get people to be familiar with soy. We are very fortunate in the United States to have market development programming support from the U.S. Department of Agriculture and to have a robust checkoff that provides us funding to be able to go out and do these efforts to try and you know educate people on soy because some people aren't very familiar with what it is how to use it all of those types of things it's viewed as a rotational crop and our corn friends still like to tell us we're a rotational crop but we'll we'll debate that some other time but i, I mean I, I think that you you've got to deal with with the fact that, yes, I mean, you can't open a market and not benefit everybody, but that's the point. It benefits everybody. And so the old adage of rising tide raises all boats. So you have that. 
And certainly the work that we do kind of on the front end, it, it isn't just for US typically. It is just to try and have a trade friendly environment and to, to get systems in place so that there can be trade. But when you get down into the, you know, certainly in the expansion and the mature markets, that's where the real differentiation takes place. In emerging, we start to take differentiating into account because there is, it can be a value proposition for US soy that can't be appreciated in the early market development. So our objective in the end is to try and have people prefer U.S. soy. So first of all, you get them to want soy and understand how to use it. And then our work kicks off with them preferring U.S. soy. And so that's what the majority of our marketing efforts are towards. We've got about five minutes left here. And uh, so I uh, want to give uh, one last opportunity for uh, all of our panelists to uh, offer their thoughts. Uh, obviously, appreciate the time that uh, you've all offered. Appreciate the questions that have been submitted from the audience. But I'm going to take moderator's prerogative and kind of wrap things up here. Uh, and uh, I want to ask uh, one question, if you could all respond in, uh, in 60 seconds or less. I, I won't uh, have a timer and a bell uh, queued up. But uh, just uh, wondering, as you kind of sit here, look at the things that come across your desk, look at all the various things uh, that are available to you, available to your position, wondering something in the next 12 months that, uh, that really excites you, something that you think uh, will be, uh, something that you think is on the horizon is going to be happening and uh, really has that potential to come to fruition here in the next 12 months. I'm going to go clockwise uh, as, as uh, you all are appearing on my screen. So uh, Carrie, you're, you're going to draw the short end of the stick here and I'm going to ask you to go first. Well, um, I'm going to I'm going to go, you know, I, I talked about the soy excellence centers, I see some real, real opportunities there. Um, they have just gotten kicked off uh, in the last uh, year or so. I think we haven't begun to see the effects that we have in, in our ability to talk about the the value of soy and the 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 value of US soy in particular. Um, and I think it'll really help our supply chains uh, in these destination markets that are that are really growing. I think we have some real opportunities to talk about um, sustainability and to talk about the farmer message from the U.S. and how U.S. is produced, the U.S. soy is produced. So I think there's some real opportunities um, in that space, um, as well as some other differentiation uh, opportunities we have in the markets. Very good. Roz, your thoughts on, uh, on what's on the horizon? You know, I so I work in market access. I'm kind of like the, the problem shop, right? Like nobody ever calls me just to say things are going great. But where I am very optimistic is some of the progress we're seeing in some of these developing markets and particularly in Asia or in um, the uh, sub-Saharan Africa. You know, we're fielding more and more questions from places that we've never had any interactions and even places that wish has had very little interactions and maybe only done, you know, some market assessments. And we're being invited in to try and help them with their biosafety regulatory system to try and make them understand how trade works and how it can benefit everybody, including their local farmers. And to me, that's really exciting stuff. I mean, to, to see the discussions taking place in a place like Kenya, where they've had a, a GMO ban since 2012, there's a there's a push among some people who understand the potential for trade and the potential that technology can unlock for their farmers. So to see some of these these conversations and for us as the U.S. to be invited in to provide that discussion, I think is 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 exciting stuff. Very good, Chris. Thoughts on uh, your port portfolio that you handle there at Wish and, and what that looks like over the next year. Yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited uh, about our aquaculture, our uh, USDA funded aquaculture program. Uh, we're looking to expand this program over the next year into new countries like Togo, Benin, Burkina Faso. Uh, we have a company that we're supporting to invest in the uh, construction of a new feed mill uh, for uh, fish feed. Um, and uh, that's really exciting. We have some great partners on the ground that um, continue to demonstrate just excellent technical abilities and just they're really enthusiastic and excited to share their knowledge with uh, other industry members and um, just the partnerships that we formed over the um, past year uh, continue to, to build and um, and we just yeah have really some really exciting um, partners to be working with over the next year so I'm, I'm just really optimistic and looking forward to that thanks very good Gina 
Chris mentioned a lot in his presentation about resiliency of our partners, especially over the past year and a half. Um, they were able to pivot the products they offered, how they delivered their products, um, innovating new products um, through the chaos of the past year and a half. And so I think that it's important for us to remember that even in these developing markets, that sometimes um, we don't put as much emphasis, you know, as they're not importing as much soy, but they are creating new opportunities and new ways to incorporate soy. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the companies we work with in all three of our regions, because um, they're constantly coming to us asking for more technical assistance, asking for more connections um, and creating new products. So I'm really excited to see how um, many new innovations and new ideas come once the world hopefully settles down a little bit. All right, bring us home, Liz. All right, I think that one of the most exciting things for me is as we hopefully continue to move into this uh, post COVID recovery phase that there's been this renewed focus on the importance of affordable, healthy food and us soy can play a really key role in that globally. And so I think that's re a really exciting space for us to be in. And I really look forward to see where we go from here. Very good. Well, obviously a lot of ground covered, a lot of uh, interest in this topic from our audience, a lot a very active uh, Q and a function. I apologize. We were not able to get to everyone's thoughts, but uh, Liz, Gina, Chris, Roz, and Carrie, thank you so much for joining us. We will uh, now again uh, offer our thanks to the folks and our sponsors for this event, the United Soybean Board, the U.S. Soybean Export Council, the American Soybean Association, and ASA's World Initiative for Soy and Human Health for their sponsorship and support of this webinar. As a reminder, uh, this will be uh, this was a recorded webinar. It will be available uh, later today on our website at agripulse.com. Would encourage you to stop by, view that again. If there was something you'd like to get a, maybe a bit of a refresher course on, something you'd like to share with a colleague, we'd encourage you to stop by and uh, view this webinar and share it from agripulse.com. That's going to do it for today. Uh, I'm Spencer Chase. Appreciate you joining us. Have a good one.